This is the person detectives now say is wanted for the murders of Honey and Barry Sherman. Investigators say it's unclear if the suspect was working alone or with someone else. But on the evening of December 13th, 2017, two days before the billionaire couple was found dead next to the indoor pool in the basement of their mansion, the suspect was tracked on video, arriving by foot in the area of 50 Old Colony Road and later leaving from that same address. The suspect also disappears from camera view during the time frame that investigators determined the murder took place. This is one of those cases that still have people wondering what really happened to these two billionaires who were found deceased 10 days before Christmas in 2017. The founder of a pharmaceutical company, 75-year-old Barry Sherman and his wife, 70-year-old Honey Sherman, their bodies were found inside their $6.9 million Toronto mansion. Their bodies were discovered beside their indoor pool by a realtor who was selling their home and showing it to potential clients. Toronto police quickly ruled this a murder-suicide. But after a private investigator was hired, it was changed to a double homicide investigation. Speculation that someone very close to the couple was responsible for this heinous crime. Till this day, this case has not been solved and remains one of the biggest mysteries in the world. Currently, a $35 million reward is on the table for anyone who can provide information that could lead to the arrest of the person responsible. But it's almost been seven years since their murders and this case remains unsolved. I'm going to take you guys along with me to see where everything happened because I actually live about 12 minutes from the crime and I've been so invested in this case so I thought it'd be interesting to go there in person and see how it looks after all these years. So let's talk about it. Bernard Charles Sherman, also known as Barry Sherman, was born in Toronto on February 25th, 1942. Barry was described as awkward and introverted as a teen. He didn't have many friends and he didn't do so well in school very early on. But as he got older, he realized that he was really good at math and science and eventually he became passionate for these subjects and decided that he wanted to do something in this field when he got older. Barry went on to get his degree in engineering science at MIT then went back to Toronto to get his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Toronto. In 1965, he graduated with a perfect GPA of 5.0. So clearly, Barry was really smart, and this is something that you're going to notice throughout the story. While Barry attended school, he wanted to spend his summers doing something productive, so he decided to start working with his uncle, Lou Winter, who owned Empire Labs. Empire Labs was one of the first genetic pharmaceutical companies in Canada at the time. Barry's job at his uncle's company was very simple. He was in charge of picking up urine samples and delivering it to the labs. Barry would later go on to say that he never thought that working for his uncle in the summer would later prove to be a critical importance to his future career. And you'll see why. Fast forward in November 1965, Barry's uncle Lou, who owned Empire Labs, passed away from a brain aneurysm. But what's even crazier is that only a few months later, Lou's wife, Beverly, also passes away. It's not clear what her cause of death was, but it was very weird that they both passed away very close in time of each other. Now, to add to that, together they had four very young sons who were basically left without both parents. But not only that, Empire Labs, this very successful company that they both owned, was now pretty much left up in the air. The company was passed on to a board of trustees who appointed a new CEO, and after some time, it was said that the company was doing very bad. So when Barry found this out, he asked the board if he can buy Empire Labs. He felt like he can bring it back to what it once was. And two years later, after he begged them to buy the company, he finally did at the age of 23. But he didn't do this alone. He teamed up with his high school friend, Joel, and they both bought Empire Labs. Barry and Joel ran Empire Labs for about five years. It was said that they completely turned the company around, making it more profitable than ever. By the end of 1972, sales have reached around $2 million a year. Then 
then in 1973, Barry and Joel decided to sell Empire Labs and both of them together launched Appletex, a company that would later be worth billions of dollars. Now, if you don't know much about Apotex, well, let me tell you. It became one of the largest generic drug manufacturers in the world. And by 2017, Barry was worth around $4.5 billion. Apotex was set to sell over 300 generic drugs in more than 150 countries. And let's just say Barry was a very, very intelligent man and a great businessman. And together with his business partner, they said that they were going to get to the next level and that's exactly what they did now around this time while barry watched his company grow and become more and more successful he was introduced to this beautiful woman named honey honey was born in 1948 and her birth name was actually anna and she changed it when she went to high school she was born in a refugee camp in austria to her polish parents who were holocaust survivors honey and her family later immigrated to canada when she was really young and they settled in Toronto. When Barry and Honey were introduced by a friend in 1970, they quickly fell in love and got married a year later. They would go on to have four kids together, Lauren, who's the oldest, then Jonathan, then Alexandra, and the last one was Kaylin. Barry and Honey were very well known in their community as philanthropists and were very generous with their money. They donated millions to different charities and organizations, and this included healthcare, education, education, politics, Holocaust remembrance, and a few others. In total, their donations was something around $100 million, which is a crazy amount of money. This couple was extremely respected and had strong relationships with people and organizations. Something that everyone could agree is that Barry and Honey were really big on giving back, and this is something that they taught their kids from a very young age. And a quote that they always reminded their kids was, with great privilege comes enormous responsibility. And that's something that they say they've always remembered. They were also well-known members and supporters of the Jewish community. Honey especially, she was very much involved and had a seat in various Jewish committees in Toronto. It's been said that she was very passionate because of her background and her Jewish family. Honey's close friends described her as being funny and outgoing, and they said that she always took care of them. They said that although Honey was a billionaire, she wasn't materialistic at all and lived a very frugal life. But the other side to Barry and Honey that a lot of people might not know isn't actually so pretty. Other people who have met Honey a couple of times said that she was pretty rude and did not have the best attitude. Some say that she was very obnoxious and very difficult to work with and it was either her way or no way. Barry, on the other hand, had a lot of issues on the business side of things. He had hundreds of pending lawsuits and family drama regarding money. People have said that Barry was very knowledgeable on the legal side of things. He basically tried to sue anyone he could if they did something slightly against his business. Business. And these amounts were ridiculous, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we'll get into that. Barry treated Apotex like his baby. He worked for long hours every day and put all his energy into his business. Together, Barry and Honey became one of the richest people in North America, but we all know that money and status attracts a lot of attention. And there was definitely people in their circle that did not have the best intentions. However, never in a million years did anyone expect what was to come on December 15th, 2017. On this day at 8.30 a.m., Barry and Honey's housekeeper arrived at their mansion on 50 Colony Road. Their house was huge, approximately 12,000 square feet, which included an indoor pool, gym, and a huge backyard with a tennis court. This location in Toronto is considered to be more upscale, where wealthy people like executives, doctors, and business people tend to live. Around this time, Barry and Honey put their mansion out for sale for $6.9 million, and for some 
some people this may seem like an outrageous amount of money for this home but again this is toronto homes are really expensive here but this location has beautiful houses all around basically only rich people live in this neighborhood and so the shermans were selling this home and were building a new 25 million dollar mansion in forest hill which is one of toronto's most expensive areas so the shermans had a housekeeper named nelia who would come in on a regular basis and clean their house it was important for them to have their house clean at all times because of the showings they wanted to make sure that their house looked spotless when the housekeeper nelia arrived that friday morning at 8 25 a.m the first thing she noticed was honey's car parked where she usually parks she noticed that there was no tire marks on the snow which meant that honey hadn't left with her car since the day before she also noticed a few rolled up toronto newspapers just laying on the ground beside the front door so she picked them up and she used the side door to enter the home nelia would go on to say that before entering the home she had this weird dark feeling when she entered the home the security alarm did not go off which is really weird because she said that it's usually on even if honey and barry were inside the house but she didn't think too much of it and just thought that maybe they forgot to set it up nelia starts cleaning and begins with the rooms upstairs and then makes her way down a few minutes later the sherman's personal trainer megan shows up they had a workout session scheduled that morning with megan and so when she saw nelia she asked her if she knew where honey and barry were nelia told megan maybe they're just in the rooms upstairs i'll go check and see if they're there so nelia goes to their rooms and checks and they're not there megan the trainer said that she's gonna wait around a little bit maybe they're late and they'll be home soon so she waits around but then she eventually just leaves nelia continues to clean and makes her way slowly to the main floor and that's when she notices honey's cell phone just laying on the ground beside the powder room she thought okay this is weird why is honey's cell phone just randomly on the floor so she picks it up and puts it on the counter in the powder room again she's not thinking too deep into this she probably thought that honey just dropped her phone i mean we all drop our phone sometimes except we actually pick it up but nelia is there to do her job and she's not there to question anyone especially the shermans a little later this man shows up to fix the furnace so he was scheduled to come in that morning and take a look at their furnace so he went to the basement and started doing his job then shortly after the gardener shows up and she starts watering all the plants inside the house so this is a very very busy morning with so many people already coming in and out of the house soon after that morning the sherman's listing agent elise stern shows up for a schedule showing with another realtor and two of their clients so at this point we have the housekeeper nelia the furnace guy the gardener the listing agent who's elise stern and the realtor with two of their clients clearly there was a lot going on that morning in that house but to everyone's knowledge the sherman's weren't home the realtor and the two clients begin their tour around the house they started with the upstairs then they toured the main floor and then they made their way to the basement all the way to the end of the basement is where the indoor pool was located so the listing agent begins guiding everyone to go check out this gorgeous pool and as she's walking towards the pool room she notices a pair of thick black driving gloves just laying on the ground and beside the gloves was the home inspection report that Barry was supposed to give her. Then a little bit more to the side was a Blackberry phone that belonged to Barry. And she knew this was Barry's phone because Barry was one of the only people she knew that still used a Blackberry. Elise thought this was weird, but she picked it up really quickly in the moment because she didn't want her clients to see that there was things all over the floor. And she was so focused on the showing that she didn't really think too much of it. Elise continues walking towards the swimming pool and when she opens the door there's really no light except for the light that's coming from beneath the swimming pool based on the photos this was a pretty big pool it was 45 feet from one end to the other and the pool is surrounded by metal hand railings then elise sees from afar two people in a sitting position 
with their backs facing them. Now, she can't really see who it is because again, it's really dark in there except for the pool lights. So all you can see are two dark figures. The realtor continued to walk inside the room to turn on the lights. But before she turned them on, she realized very quickly that these two people were actually Barry and Honey. And at first she thought that they were doing some yoga pose. Everything was just happening so fast and it took her a few seconds to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once it hits her, she turns around and redirects the client and the realtor out of the room before they saw anything. She tells them to go look at other areas around the house and then the realtor runs to the housekeeper and to the gardener and tells them that something is wrong with Honey and Barry downstairs. The gardener her offered to go down there to check what was going on so she opened the pool door and walked directly up to honey and barry and then she ran upstairs and told them that they were dead in that moment at 11 43 a.m at least the realtor called police and told them somebody killed my clients the way honey and barry's bodies were found and described by those who first saw them was that they were in a seated position with their legs spread out side by side with belts around their neck tied to the swimming pool hand railing honey had some dried blood on her face however barry didn't have any blood on him but what he did have was his glasses still sitting perfectly on his face which is really weird and something very eerie about how they were found was that the position of their bodies looked very similar to two art figures they had displayed in their house these two sculptures were very big and apparently they were supposed to mimic berry and honey some of their friends and family thought that these sculptures were very creepy but honey and berry absolutely loved it and they showed this to everyone but the fact that they were found deceased in a position very similar to these two sculptures that they loved so much just feels like too much of a coincidence news about honey and Barry's death quickly spread and throughout the next couple of weeks everyone was constantly talking about it this was one of the biggest cases in Canada and the world everyone was shocked and couldn't believe it and no one saw this coming during the first couple of days no one really knew the details of how they were found and so everyone began having their own theories now the entire investigation from the very beginning was done horribly you would assume because they were billionaires and were so known and respected Expected, they would have the best of the best working on this case. But no, it didn't happen that way. When investigators arrived to the scene, they separated the realtor, the gardener, and the housekeeper and began asking them questions. But a little later, the housekeeper, who was probably in shock and scared and confused, continued cleaning the house, not knowing that it was a crime scene she probably didn't know what to do in that moment but it took police a while to see what she was doing and tell her to stop because she was potentially cleaning evidence from the crime scene police then took a look at honey and barry's bodies with the belts still around their necks in the same position and they quickly ruled it a murder suit their theory was that one of them took the other person's life and then took their own life or that they both decided to take their lives together. Which sounds pretty ridiculous considering who these people were. This new detective, his name was Brandon Price and on that day, he gave a statement to the public. At this point uh, in the investigation, though it is very early, um, we uh, are not currently uh, seeking or uh, looking for an outstanding suspect um, and that's about all I can say with regard to that. I can say that uh, we did not observe any signs of uh, forced entry to the to the building um, and so uh, at this point uh, indications are that we have no outstanding suspect to uh, be going after. Again, insinuating that Barry most likely took Honey's life and then took his own. This narrative had so many people confused and asking questions because everyone who knew the Shermans knew that they would never do this. Also, if Barry wanted to take Honey's life, why not do it a more simple way? Barry had access to thousands of drugs. Wouldn't that method 
just make more sense. Police really screwed up this case because they took their sweet time to do any type of investigating. For example, police didn't bother going to Barry's office to ask for any surveillance footage of the couple the last time they were there. It was said that the security guard who worked at Appletex and saw Barry and Honey leaving on that night was the one who went to retrieve this footage and he personally asked police to take a look at it. And the worst part is that police didn't even look at this footage until a month later. They even took long interviewing key persons of interest. What blows my mind is that a neighbor took initiative to call police and tell them that they reviewed their own home surveillance footage and saw something weird. They told them that they saw someone standing in front of the Sherman's house for approximately 25 minutes the day before their bodies were found. Why are neighbors contacting police and telling them what they found and not the other way around? So it was definitely clear that police screwed up from the very beginning. And again, these were billionaires who were very respected and involved in the community and donated a lot of money and were very known. So if police are not going to take this case seriously, then what does that mean for everyone else? When the four Sherman kids heard of this theory that police were telling everyone, they were really upset. They told police that their parents would never do this. They told police how excited their parents were for the future and that the entire family had plans to go to Florida in the upcoming weeks. One of the kids also just welcomed a new grandchild into the family. So their parents were so excited about this and this just doesn't add up. It was later discovered that two days before their bodies were found, Honey did not show up to a board meeting for a charity event and Barry did not show up to work that morning. The last email that Barry had sent out was on December 13th at 8.23 p.m., two days before their bodies were found, meaning that this was most likely the same night that they lost their lives. When an autopsy was finally done, police concluded that the cause of death was ligature compression. They stuck to the story that Barry strangled Honey and then took his own life with the belt that was around his neck. And their theory was that Barry used the pool's hand railing to strangle himself. But if Barry was found in a sitting position with his legs on the floor, how would he be able to do this? Wouldn't it be easy to just get up when your survival skills kick in? Barry and Honey's children felt like the police were incompetent, so they decided to hire a well-known lawyer from Toronto named Brian Greenspan. And apparently Brian Greenspan is one of Canada's top criminal lawyers, which if you had a lot of money, you knew to go to this guy. They also hired a pathologist to do a second autopsy just to make sure that that everything was consistent with the first one. And let me tell you, what they discovered after looking deeper into this case is wild. First of all, the position that Barry and Honey were found should have never suggested that they were hung because they were not hanging above the ground in any way. Like I said, they were sitting on the floor slouched back with a belt around their necks. In order for it to be considered a hung position, their feet should not be touching the ground because only that way would there be enough weight and pressure put on their necks to cause strangulation. The pathologist also said that they found bruises around their wrist, which was consistent with their wrist being tied. And it was said that these bruises were more severe on Barry's wrists than Honey's. So if their theory is that Barry was the culprit, then why would he tie his own wrists? I just can't stop and think, why didn't the police think of this? And why did it take a private investigator to figure this all out. The private investigator concluded that Barry and Honey's bodies were placed there to confuse people. And it is possible that they may have been unalived somewhere else in the house and then they were taken into the swimming pool room. The investigators established a timeline of what they think happened on the day of the murders. And the story is that Honey entered the house from the front door and was ambushed by one or two people. She tried to run to the powder room, close the door, and call police but was grabbed tied up, taken to the basement, and was strangled. Then the culprits waited for Barry to arrive home from work that night. And when he entered the home through the garage door, he was attacked, and that's when his gloves, papers, and phone fell to the ground. They believe that Barry fought back, but he was overpowered, then he was tied up, and then he was also strangled. When this information was presented to police, they quickly changed the story from a murder-suicide 
to a double homicide investigation. And let me tell you, people were not happy with the police. Can you imagine if the family never hired their own private investigator? They would have never done anything to investigate this case. Now, at this point, weeks have gone by and investigators were starting from scratch again. When you wait this long to start an investigation, evidence is lost and potential witness interviews are not as reliable anymore because people forget things. Everything just gets very cloudy. Investigators began looking into the people closest to Honey and Barry, which was their family and their close friends. And after really digging in, police realized that there were so many people who had motives to get rid of the Shermans. One being their four children, they suspected that maybe it was the four children together. I mean, they had so much to gain from their parents gone. They did inherit $3.2 billion dollars each once their parents passed away. So it was three sisters. It was Lauren who was the oldest, Alexandra, and then Kaylin. And then they also had a son named Jonathan. Apparently all three sisters had a pretty normal relationship with their parents, but it was said that Alexandra actually had a closer relationship with Honey and Barry. And it was alleged that Honey and Barry were actually selling their mansion so that they can build a new house that was around $25 million, really close to where Alexandra lived. When it came to their son Jonathan, people had a lot to say. Jonathan's behavior was by far the most strange. Apparently, there had been some tension between Barry and Jonathan over money. Barry had loaned Jonathan $60 million so that he can start businesses of his own. And two weeks before Barry passed away, he asked Jonathan to pay him back. These conversations between Barry and Jonathan were happening through email. And through these emails, Jonathan would express how annoyed he was at his father because he would loan money to a lot of people but would only press Jonathan to pay him back. Jonathan claimed that his father gave millions to one of his friends named Frank D'Angelo. Frank D'Angelo was a close friend that Barry had and this man was very much involved in Hollywood. Well, he basically tried to get into Hollywood by being in these movies and trying different things and being an actor but a lot of that failed. This man apparently blew a lot of Barry's money to start different businesses. And it was said that despite all these failures, Barry still funded his life. Jonathan told his father in an email that he was actually doing a lot of great things with the money that was lent to him. He said that his businesses are actually doing well and he's making money while his buddy Frank was losing everything. But we'll get into Frank D'Angelo in a little bit. Aside from this, Barry's friends and family said, that Jonathan's behavior after their deaths was very inconsistent. His behavior was different depending on who he was with. Sometimes he would cry and be hysterical and sometimes he was very calm and composed, which is something people found very, very weird. And you know how I said that a $10 million reward was announced by the Sherman kids for any information of the person involved? Well, Jonathan added an extra $25 million of his own money to the cash prize. And this is very tricky because why would Jonathan offer to hire a private investigator to look deeper into the case if he was guilty? Why would he offer to increase the cash prize? Did he do this to perhaps throw people off and seem like he's trying to contribute to solving this case? A lot of people on the internet really think that it was Jonathan and he did this because he had the most to gain from his parents gone. Another person investigators became extremely interested in is Barry's cousin, Carrie Winter. And this guy is very interesting because of what he said during an interview. So Carrie is one of the four children of Lou Winter. Remember I talked about Barry's uncle, Lou Winter, who owned Empire Labs and then he passed away from a brain aneurysm? Well, when Barry bought the company with his business partner Joel, Carrie and his three siblings at the time were still very young when this happened. The oldest sibling was about seven or eight years old at the time, so they couldn't really do anything to take over their father's company. But when Barry bought Empire Labs, it's alleged that he was well aware that his cousins owned 20% of the company. But remember that the company was doing very bad at the time. They were actually on the verge of bankruptcy. But when Barry bought it and he ran the company for five years, him and his business partner were able to bring it back up and 
make it successful again. So once Empire Labs became extremely successful again, they basically sold the company and then they launched Apotex. Well, fast forward years later, the cousins are now grown up. They actually sued Barry for $1 billion. They claimed that they were entitled to 20% of Apotex's money. But Barry argued that no, you were only entitled to 20% of Empire Labs. But that company doesn't exist anymore and now it's Apotex, so you're basically entitled to nothing. This made Carrie and his brothers really upset, but especially Carrie. However, even though they had their differences, it was said that Barry was still very generous with his money and took care of the four kids financially. If they wanted a house, Barry bought it. If they needed a car, Barry bought it. It's alleged that Barry spent a total of $15 million on these four children and he never asked for anything in return. But it seems like this wasn't enough for them, especially Carrie who really, really hated Barry and said that Barry took something that belonged to them. So this lawsuit was going on for more than 10 years until it was dismissed just a few months before Barry and Honey's death. The judge ultimately ruled that Carrie's request for $1 billion was wishful thinking and Carrie ended up owing Barry 15 million dollars back. Now I can see why this would be frustrating to these four brothers who are essentially too young to do anything about their rights to Empire Lab but I still don't think it justifies what Carrie would go on to say during an interview after the Shermans were murdered. Carrie came right out and said that the Shermans deserved to die and that it should have been much worse. When investigators asked him if he did it, he said, I quote, no, the way I would have done it wouldn't have been with a belt. It was going to be in the Apotex parking lot. He would have came out of the parking lot of Apotex and I'd be hiding behind a car and I'd just decapitate him. I wanted to roll his head down the parking lot and I'd sit there and wait for police. That is wild. Apparently, Carrie danced around his house and screamed that today was a good day when he found out about the Sherman's deaths. So that should explain to you how much he despised them, especially Barry. But investigators quickly dropped Carrie as a suspect because they believe that he didn't have the IQ to plan and execute this double homicide. Even though Carrie comes off very strong and is very hateful, they don't believe that he was the one. Now, one of the last persons of interest was Frank D'Angelo, which I spoke about him a bit earlier. This man's entire life and career was funded by Barry. Frank and Barry were considered really good friends, but Barry would essentially loan or just give a lot of money to Frank, millions of dollars, so that he can create and start all these different businesses. It's alleged that Barry spent around $250 million on Frank. And even though Barry was very generous with his friends, he was the most with Frank. And people speculate that there was something weird going on between their friendship where Barry felt like he had to give Frank all this money. It was said that perhaps Frank was blackmailing Barry and he had something on him that Barry didn't want people to know. And that's why Barry was giving him all of this money. People speculated that perhaps Frank hired someone to take out Barry because he realized that Barry was going to stop funding his life. Frank probably became comfortable with his idea of receiving so much money whenever he wanted to that he kind of felt entitled to it. And realizing that you no longer will live the same lifestyle, it can make people angry and do very crazy things. But when Frank was interviewed, he said that he didn't do it. And in fact, he actually had lunch with Barry two days before the murder. And allegedly, Frank said that Barry told him that he appreciated their friendship and now he could die without any regrets, which who says that? Aside from all this, there were other issues that were going on in Barry's life that could have potentially upset some people. He had hundreds of pending lawsuits where Barry sued other pharmaceutical companies or people who threatened his business. It was said that he sued people over the smallest things and he didn't care. And after being in this business for such a long time, Barry learned a lot about the legal aspect of his business. He also had the best lawyers by his side because again, he's a billionaire. So he had the power to solve any of 
of his problems by just simply taking people to court. Investigators also wondered whether other pharmaceutical competitors perhaps wanted Barry out of the picture because of these lawsuits or even because Apotex was so successful it was a big competitor. It was said that Barry was able to create a generic drug so similar to the original brand and they were making a ridiculous amount of money which could have been a motive. All in all, even though we don't know who the culprit is, one thing we do know is that this was planned by someone who knew the Shermans and knew the layout of their house very, very well and knew when to come in and where to go without getting caught. Barry and Honey's funeral was not like any other funeral. It was held at a huge hall where they usually have conventions and more than 6,000 people showed up and very important people like the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Mayor of Toronto showed up. So this should give you an idea of how known and important and significant the Shermans were. Now, in May 2019, their $6.9 million mansion was demolished after their kids requested that it be taken down. They stated that it pained them to have the constant reminder and just wanted it gone. But what I find very weird about this, and a lot of people have said the same thing, is that they had this home demolished with everything that Honey and Barry owned still inside. It was said that all their paintings, family photos, furniture, clothes, it was all still in there when it got demolished. You would think that their children would take as much as they could for memories because that's all they have left from their parents. But that wasn't the case. And what people still find very odd is that this case still hasn't been solved. So wouldn't it make sense to keep the house intact for evidence? One of the latest updates on this case was on December 14th, 2021, four years after their murders. Police released this footage of this suspect. It's a man walking in winter clothing near the Sherman's house on the same night after their murders. It was difficult to make out any description of this man because he's completely covered up. All they really know about this person is that he's between 5'6 to 5'9 and based on how he walks they believe that he most likely served in the military but it's also very likely that this person who committed these crimes was hired by someone that knew the Shermans and it's very very likely that this person fled to a different country and will never be found. Investigators have stated that because of this theory they have been looking at leads in five other countries. Another more recent update is that Honey's sister Mary, who was really, really close to Honey. Well, she sued the four Sherman children over Honey's estate. Mary claims that before Honey's death, she promised to leave her millions of dollars, but the Sherman kids don't believe that and they refuse to give her anything. This case still remains open and even though investigators are still looking into leads all over the world, they haven't stated any new suspects. This story is so complex. There's so many sketchy people in this case and it's really hard to pinpoint who did it. I really hope they find the person responsible for this because even if you didn't like Honey and Barry for whatever reason, I still feel like the way they exited this life was very cruel. And it's really scary that this person or persons are still free and just living their life. This is pretty much it on this case. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you really liked this video and my content, please make sure to give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also follow my other social medias if you want to keep up with me. And yeah, other than that, I'll see you guys soon in my next video. Bye. I went to visit 50 Old Colony Road where Honey and Barry's mansion used to be. Even though the property was sold in 2020 to a professional swimmer for $4.25 million, the property is up for sale again, this time for $6.5 million. So because there's no numbers, I didn't know if I was looking at 48 or 50 Old Colony Road. But after doing some more research on this, it turns out that since the property was put back on the market, the address has completely changed to 48 Colony Road. Last year, it was announced that a permit was approved to allow construction of a 12,000 square foot home and it's been said that it's going to look something like this. I tried to peek through with my camera but it was really difficult and I don't know why I thought it was going to be easy to enter this property. Again, this is 10 to 12 minutes from where I live so 
that's just crazy to think about. But hope you guys found this video interesting and I'll see you in the next one.